for coming on the podcast. Um, it's really great to be speaking with you again. Well, I'm happy to see you again. Yeah. Uh, having advantage of uh, keeping the practice going. It's a challenge off of retreat um, with so many, with such a kind of busy lifestyle. But as you make it very clear, th there's no difference between the meditation practice and your life. Um, it's all kind of the same thing. I think that's a powerful message that's not often being communicated with other meditation teachers. It's kind of all about the sitting practice and that's a separate component of yeah. living. Maybe starting from the beginning, could you talk about, um, I'm curious, how long have you been a monk? And if you could fill us in on some of your adventures, there was a, a story about yourself in, uh, in a cave with a cobra in Thailand <laughs> that I think uh, listeners would love to hear. I've been a monk for 35 years. And when I, when I first planned on becoming a monk, I thought that I would just stay a monk for one year and do the meditation and then uh, uh, get into some jhanas and, and uh, become a sotapanna. And then I would disrobe. But as soon as I put the robes on, I felt the robes grab a hold of me. Mm. And they wouldn't let go. And after a year of not being uh, really successful, I thought, well, I've got more to do, so I'm, I'm just going to stay a rope, stay in the robes for a while. The first five or six years of being a monk, I did a lot of meditation. When I say a lot, I did, well, all told is about 12 three-month three retreats. I did an eight-month retreat in Burma. And I did a two-year retreat in Burma. And all this time I was doing uh, the straight Vipassana practice, the way it's being taught at Mahasi Center. And I wasn't satisfied with the end results. Then I went to, I, I left Burma at the time after doing a two year retreat there. And I came back to Malaysia where I had um, been staying for a period of time. And a lot of people were very excited to have me come back and they wanted to learn meditation from me. But I, with a clear conscience, I could not uh, teach the Vipassana the way it was being taught. I was just not satisfied with that kind of meditation. And this was about the time that Bhikkhu Bodhi had uh, brought out his book of uh, the Majjhima Nikaya. And I was asked to go to uh, the, the biggest Theravada monastery in Kuala Lumpur. Chief, Chief Reverend uh, Keshri Damananda was an abbot. And while I was there, someone gave me a copy of the Majjhima Nikaya by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And I started reading it and I started seeing that the instructions in the meditation was definitely different from what I was being taught to practice. I was being taught to practice, note everything until it goes away and then come back to 
what they called the primary object of meditation. And as I was going through the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, I started reading the instructions and I started seeing there's definitely something that's been changed. And it happened to be that they changed the instructions in the meditation away from right effort in the Eightfold Path. The right effort says that first you notice that your mind is distracted. You have a hindrance arise. The second part is you let go of that uh, distraction without keeping your attention to it. You just don't keep your attention on that anymore. Then you bring up something that's wholesome, your object to meditation. And you stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. Now that's quite different from what they call um, oh, uh, choiceless awareness and things like that. It's quite different from that. That's, and as I was reading the instruction, which is only four sentences in the uh, Majjhima Nikaya in the Satipatthana Sutta. There's only four sentences for the instructions. Now, I was taught that to keep my attention very closely focused on the breath. And you, you see the first part of, of a breath, you see the middle of the breath, you see the end of the breath. And then it goes backwards after that, so that you, you see the release of the breath. Now in the instructions, it doesn't say anything about following the breath at the nostril tip or the abdomen. It just says, that you understand when you take a long breath or when, when you take a short breath. Understanding does not mean focus on, it does not mean to the exclusion of everything else. Understanding means that you, you know when your breath is short and when it's long. You know when your breath is fast and when it's uh, slow you know when your, your breath is very subtle and when it's very gross. So you know what the breath is doing, but you don't focus on the breath. And that was a big difference in the instructions. Later on, I found out that you use the breath as a reminder to follow the rest of the instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta. The second part, or the next part, the last part of the instructions is very clear. It says on the in-breath, you tranquilize the bodily formation. On the out-breath, you tranquilize the body, bodily formation. And to me, that became apparent as I started practicing that way, that the, you were using the breath as the reminder to tranquilize the bodily formation. Now, most people in the West, what I found out through my own practice and observing other people's practice. The bodily formation 
can be seen and recognized as tension and tightness in your body. And as I was trying to decipher what that meant, I was I, I had just given uh, instructions to uh, a retreat. And I started thinking about the uh, tension and tightness that I had in my head all the time when I was doing the straight vipassana. And sometimes that uh, got real strong and very painful. As I was walking back to my room, I thought, started thinking about that tightness in my head which my Vipassana teachers had told me, just ignore it, it's nothing, you don't have, to, it'll go away eventually. So I thought, maybe that's it. Maybe that is what re relaxing the, uh, tranquilizing the bodily formation meant. So, my mindfulness was very sharp because I'd been doing so much meditation before. And I, I thought, well, there is this tightness. I wonder what happens if I re -let, let go of that tightness in my head. And what I noticed was all of the thoughts that I had from the distraction, from the hindrance that had arisen, stopped. I didn't have any thoughts coming into my mind. My mind was very alert. My mind was very much at ease. And my mind became more pure because I was letting go of this tension and tightness. And later it dawned on me that this tension and tightness that was in my head happened every time I had a distraction, every time my mind got caught up in some kind of hindrance, whatever that happened to be. As soon as I relaxed, there was no more hindrance. My mind was pure. And I started looking at what is that tension and tightness. And I came to the realization that the tension and tightness in my mind was also a tightness in my body. And as I started on the in-breath relaxing and on the out-breath relaxing, I started realizing that this tension and tightness was craving. And, and this craving would stay as long as I was involved with or tried to control a hindrance whenever it came up. But when I relaxed, my mind was clear. My mind was very alert. And I got real excited about that. So all the way back to my room, I, anytime a hindrance came up, I was relaxing and this was proving to me more and more that this was something new in the instruction that had been ignored uh, with the other methods that was being taught at the time, at least to me. After a, a few weeks of practicing this way, I went to the head monk and I said, Bhante, I have to go uh, take a couple of weeks off and go practice by myself. I know there's a cave in 
in Malay in uh, Thailand. That's very suitable. It had running water in it and things like that, which is very necessary for a monk. And so I got permission just to take off and I went into Thailand and I went to this cave and I got everything set up and I was ready to go. And I noticed that in uh, one of the corners of the cave, which was very big, it was maybe 15 or 20 feet high. It let a lot of light in there. It was, it had this little running stream, but in one of the corners, there was a cobra. So I have a tendency to talk to animals. So I made an agreement with him that I wouldn't bother him if he didn't bother me. And began doing the meditation. Now this, this cave, it was only about, oh, maybe 500 uh, meters away from this village. So I could go into the village, get alms, have something to eat. I would do that early in the morning in Thailand. It's uh, monks go out on alms round while it's still cool in, in the morning, right after the sun comes up. And I would go into alms round, gather the alms and go back to the cave, eat the, eat the food, take the, take a bath. And then I would start studying the Majjhima Nikaya, which I brought with me. So every morning I was reading the Majjhima Nikaya till around 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Then I would walk and I would sit uh, for the rest of the day. And I would stop around 11 o'clock or so, sometimes 12 o'clock. Now, one of the things that I had been taught with the Mahasi method is you uh, sit for an hour and you walk for an hour. And I was finding out that when the meditation was very good, I wanted to sit longer, so I started sitting longer. It didn't happen with every sitting, but it was very, uh, very comfortable when I was sitting longer. And naturally, my length of time that I was sitting started to stretch out to an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, sometimes four hours. Using the breath as the reminder to relax seemed to be the key. I wound up starting to understand hindrances more and more and why hindrances pull your attention away from your object of meditation. And I would notice that I would get involved with the hindrance and try to stop it and push it away and force it to let go. But every time that I relaxed, I didn't have to do that anymore. I would naturally let go. As soon as I noticed the hindrance arising, then I would relax and uh, bring up my object of meditation. That was a wholesome thing and stay with the object of meditation. And I, I felt more and more relaxed and I felt more and more happy as time went by. After two weeks of doing the practice, I felt like, no, I, I can't quit now. I have to continue going. 
So every morning I was reading different suttas, trying to understand what they were talking about, which became more and more clear. And I wound up staying there for three months. Then I would have stayed longer, but the chief monk sent somebody to come get me and told me that I had to go back to, to Malaysia and help the chief monk. Every, every Friday for many, many years, the chief monk gave a Dhamma talk at, at Friday, and it lasted, a, a, talk, a Dhamma talk was about two hours long. And he said one of the reasons that he asked me to come to the Malaysia was so that I could give him some rest. So every other Friday, I was giving a Dhamma talk. And then when I left, he was having to do it all on his own. So that's why he asked me to come back. When I came back, I couldn't teach the straight Vipassana that I had practiced for 20 years because I didn't have any confidence in that. So people got real excited when I came back and they said, well, teach us meditation. So I, somebody came from a, a big group of, uh, of uh, college graduates. And they asked me to give a, a retreat, a weekend retreat. When I gave the weekend retreat, I started changing the way that I had uh, practiced giving Dhamma talks. I started changing it so it was more practical. And I told them I was only going to teach them loving kindness. And there was about 60 people that came for that retreat. And everybody really, really liked it. And they started feeling more happy. I started teaching this and it became very popular. Um, sometimes for a, a meditation class, I did once a week and there would be Oh, 30, 40, 50 people that would come. And then they were starting to practice loving kindness. And I started, I always gave a Dhamma talk after the sitting. And people started to see the advantage of doing that and they became more happy. They would uh, bring uh, a tape recorder in and, and tape the Dhamma talks that I was giving and Thich Nhat Hanh came to Malaysia and was giving talks wherever he gave his talks and somebody gave him a tape of one of my talks on smiling and the advantage of smiling and that's when he started picking up on that and telling people they had to smile more with their daily activities and that sort of thing. I never got a chance to meet him, which is unfortunate. So some people listening might be unfamiliar with some of the, um, with some of the story because they might not understand the kind of traditional text, but just to summarize for them, you the methods you were practicing before the Vipassana were taken from commentary texts called the Vasudhimagga and, and other commentaries. Right. And you took the, you took the teachings from the historical Buddha, the uh, Siddhar Siddhartha Gautama. And right. these were more directly what he had been teaching, which right. was leading to much greater transformations in people's mind. That was actually leading to a more permanent end to their, to their suffering. Um, and that's actually what I was hoping you could speak about next is like a lot of people are trying to, are meditating um, with the hope of kind of a quick fix stress reduction tool. 
And I think what's incredible about what you're teaching is that there is actually a greater transformation that's possible here and a, even a cognitive um, event that can that you call awakening that can completely transform your way of life. And I think people might be kind of skeptical of that and just want to hear like, what is Nibbana and how does that process work? Nibbana is an interesting word. It's been built up so that it's some kind of mystical, magical kind of experience that transforms you into a more uplifted, aware kind of consciousness. There's two kinds of Nibbana. And when I uh, came back to America, and started teaching and started telling people about the two different kinds of Nibbana, they'd never heard of that. And they started thinking, oh, that, this is something that's really weird and it's not like the kind of teaching that I've been getting. But every time you use the relax step, you are experiencing Nibbana. Okay, you know, your, your, your brain is like this. And there's a membrane that goes around your brain. It's called the meninges. It's basically a bag that just goes around your brain. And it always stays the same. Every time you have a thought, Every time you have a feeling arise or a sensation arise, it causes the brain to expand against the meninges. And that's what that tension and tightness is. As soon as you relax, that what it means is you are letting go of craving. When, it, when there's tension and tightness, that means that there is, um, there is craving there. Now, I'd spent 12 years in Asia and being a very curious type, I was going around to all these different major teachers and asking them what exactly is craving and how are you supposed to recognize it? And I always got a very generalized idea of what craving is. Oh, it's desire. It's wanting something. And I found out that that's not it. That's not a, a good definition. Now we get to the word Nibbana. Ni means no. Bana means fire. And that is referring to craving. So every time you relax that tension and tightness, you're letting go of the craving, which is letting go of the heat or fire that is the craving. And when you let go of the craving, you start relaxing more into the hindrances and letting them go. And this causes a personality change. So craving is another word for uh, Nibbana. And when you relax, relax the little tension and tightness in your head, in your body, actually the meninges that surround your brain also goes all the way down your spine. So when you relax here, you're relaxing your entire bodily formation. You don't notice it much in the rest of your body. 
until you become more aware of or mindful of what mind is doing. Now, I give a definition of mindfulness that is much different than what other people say. You ask somebody, what, what is mindfulness? Well, that's awareness. And that, yeah, it's true. It is a kind of awareness, but it's a, a surface kind of definition. And people, uh, oh, I wasn't mindful about this or that. And they, they talk about it, but they talk about it. They don't tell you what it is. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. How does that happen? Mindfulness is being more aware of the process of how mind gets distracted. When you see the process, then you start seeing the impersonal nature of these thoughts and feelings that come up and distract you away from your object of meditation. Could you walk us through this path to Nibbana as it's laid out, or Nirvana, I guess, is the Sanskrit um, for those who were, cause I mean, this was something that I didn't realize was so accessible until I went on one of your retreats that this map is very kind of clearly laid out. And I know we don't have, um, you know, we don't have time to go in detail, but just the, the kind of general process or map here, I think it might be interesting for those listening. When I got back and I started teaching straight from the suttas. I started reading suttas to people. I started noticing a definite change in their personalities. They became much softer. They became more alert. They didn't get caught up as much in emotional upsets. And I attributed that to the meditation itself. Now, one of the reasons that I insist that you start smiling and keep your smiling going, I don't care what you're doing, whether you're taking a shower or eating food, smile. The reason is that it improves your mindfulness so you can see that first step that re recognize when your mind is starting to get distracted. As you do this more and more, you begin to progress in the meditation. You'll stay with your object of meditation for longer periods of time. And there are advantages of doing that. And you get into a jhana. Now, I don't tell you what jhana you're in because that's just a, another means of puffing your chest up and having a lot of, I'm in this jhana. And this, for a lot of people, this is the first time that joy has, has arisen in them. And they get kind of excited. Now, after the joy, and it fades away by itself, because this is a very natural pro process, then they become very peaceful. They become very alert and they feel more at ease. They just feel more comfortable for a period of time and they're able to stay with the object of meditation for longer periods of time. This is the first jhana. Now the definition I give to jhana is it's a stage of meditation. This is like a signpost that you're going down the road and you see a sign that says, so, so, so many miles you get to this area, so many miles you get to that area. After you get into the first jhana, you want to progress to the next jhana. Then you let go of your verbalizing 
the wish for uh, happiness for someone else. And when you start doing that, the joy becomes much stronger. It lasts for longer. When it fades away, you become more peaceful, more calm, more comfortable in your mind and in your body. And you're able to stay with your object of meditation. Uh, when, the way I teach as a spiritual friend, you stay with your friend for longer periods of time. That is getting into the second stage of the meditation. That is, now you're in the second jhana. And as you continue on, you start getting more peaceful, more calm. The joy kind of disappears and you feel more at ease. You feel uh, more peaceful and you start to develop what we call equanimity, which is a balance of mind. And you'll be in that for a period of time. While you're in this jhana, you start losing uh, the sensation in different parts of your body. You don't notice your hands. You don't notice uh, an arm. You don't notice a leg. But if you put your attention on it, you'll notice that it's there. But while you stay with your object of meditation, you don't feel it anymore. And this is called getting into the third jhana, the third stage of the meditation. As you continue on and you start staying with your object of meditation for longer periods of time, the feeling in your heart goes up into the feeling of your head. Now, a lot of people, when they, they have this idea that the loving kindness is always supposed to be in your heart. So I warn people very often, don't push this feeling from your head back down into your heart. Let it be where it's going to be. And as you do that for longer periods of time, the, you don't feel your body anymore unless you put your attention on your body, which means that you're not staying with your object of meditation long enough. But you'll have a sense of balance of mind where you can hear a sound and the sound just kind of goes through you. You'll know that it happened You'll, you'll know that that sound arose and it was there for a period of time and then disappeared. Sometimes there's a loud clank. A uh, wind catches a hold of, uh, say, a trash can and it throws the, the lid off and there's a big clang. It doesn't make your mind shake and wobble. It just, that sound just kind of goes through you. Now, you know by this time that you are really progressing very well. There's three different stages that you go through that you know that you're doing very well. When you experience the first jhana, you have that joy arise. And the joy kind of stays with you, even though it's not near as intense. You feel that you're progressing in your meditation. Then when you get to the fourth jhana, you have this balance of mind. Where before, when there was a disturbance that came up, it made your mind wobble and, and go away. Now, you see that disturbance, but it doesn't make your mind wobble anymore. Your mind just 
kind of starts to vibrate. And then with this, with this, as you continue on, now you're getting into what is called the Arupa Jhana. The Arupa Jhana is a mental realm. You don't have uh, any feeling in your body anymore. You're staying with the loving kindness and that starts to change on its own. This is a natural process. Now, it changes. I'm not going to tell you how it changes because those are the questions that I have to find out from you. But also you start to feel an opening of mind an expansion starts to happen in all directions at the same time. Now you have experienced infinite consciousness, in, infinite space, excuse me. And that means that the expansion that's going out is, and the change in feeling is compassion. A lot of people use the word compassion and they get it mixed up with loving kindness, which is a little bit different. Again, I won't tell you what the difference is because people have to tell me. So I know that you're in that state. But this is a state that the Buddha sat in for a couple hours every morning. He sat in infinite space with compassion. And in, in the suttas, it says that he surveys the, uh, the whole world with this infinite space and compassion. A definition of compassion that I use very often is a lot different than what other people call compassion. I, uh, used to go and visit people at the hospitals and I did that for about a year and I was going every day somebody would come and say well my my relative is sick and I want you to come visit them and that sort of thing so while I was walking in the hallway to go to the room where the person was I would remind myself what compassion truly is. Compassion is seeing another person that is suffering. Allow the space for them to suffer and radiate loving kindness unconditionally to that person. One of the things that people get caught up with compassion is trying to, they get into their pity and they try to uh, take away the pain of the other person and it only makes them unhappy. And it doesn't help the person that's, that's really having a problem. But if you allow the space for them, even if there is great suffering with pain, you allow the space to be there. It's okay for them to have pain. It has to be okay because that's the truth. When pain is there, it's real and it's there. And I can't take your pain away and you can't take my pain away, but I can allow you the space to have that pain and love you without any hesitation at all. That is a definition of compassion that I use. That's what true compassion really is. It's not feeling sorry for somebody else and wishing that they didn't have that suffering. One of the biggest problems that people have when they uh, have a family member that has cancer and they're close to death is everybody feels so helpless. 
They don't want to see that. They don't want the, the person that's on their deathbed to die. And they make themselves extremely unhappy when they do that. And they don't help anybody around them when they're experiencing that. You never have to feel helpless. You have to feel compassion and allow the space for that pain to be there in yourself. And you have to radiate loving kindness to them that lifts that heavy feeling in the room when everybody is starting to wish happiness for the person that is sick or has mental upset. You radiate loving kindness to them. It's always interesting to watch people go through this stage because all of a sudden their faces become more radiant and their faces become more happy and they're actually understanding how this process of what we call life is working. And at that point, do they, is, does a lot of their suffering fall away permanently or is it just a temporary thing? It sounds like this is a bigger change. Everything is in a state of change. I can't say permanently because even the Buddha experienced pain in his body. He had a, he had a back pain. But the way he, they relate to the chain to the pain has the changed. Way you relate. It's, it's the whole the whole thing is learning how to change your perspective and how to let go of your emotional upsets. You you have five aggregates, right? You have a physical body, you have feeling, you have perception. You have thoughts and you have consciousness. Now, thoughts are part of the formations. When a feeling arises, it doesn't matter whether it's a physical feeling or a mental feeling. The perception is always attached to the feeling. Perception is the part of your mind that names the feeling. Oh, this is painful. This is pleasant. I like this. I don't like that. Then there's the thoughts that come up right after that feeling arose. And we are in the habit of trying to think a feeling away. This is a painful feeling. I don't like this. Let's say depression, okay? What is depression? Depression is a painful feeling that arises. And then you start trying to think that feeling away. And the more you try to think a feeling, the uh, bigger and more intense the feeling becomes until you can't stand it and you go to the doctor and he gives you some kind of thing that dulls your mind out. And uh, that's what's happening these days. And it's because of not understanding that this is only a feeling. Did you ask this feeling to come up? Did you say, oh, I haven't had a painful feeling for a while. I might as well have some pain come up right now. No, nobody's going to do that. So that's when you start trying to think and get caught up in your emotional upsets and try to control it with your thoughts, which only makes it worse. That's the importance of using that relaxed step in the right effort. You recognize that this feeling arose. 
you allow that feeling to be there without trying to control it. Don't make it into a big deal. And then you relax and that lets go of that thinking, thinking, thinking mind. Now your mind is clear. Then you smile and come back to your object of meditation. So using the six R's is a very useful tool in life. And that comes back to what I was saying at the beginning too, which is that you can be doing this all day long whenever you recognize what is perceived as this tension, which is this craving, wanting things to be different in that moment. At any moment, you can release that bring up a wholesome state of mind like you've been saying and then in that moment you're no longer suffering what i think is is great about what you're teaching in general is you're saying all of these things are possible but you can come and see for yourself and i certainly experienced on your retreat uh some profound just under a much more a deeper understanding of the mind and some profound states that i didn't think was possible so I, I encourage those listening to, to really put what you're saying to the test for themselves. And, you know, they don't need to take it on faith. But where would they, where would they find out more? Or how should they get started in their practice if they're interested in, in trying this out? Well, there's a couple different ways. One is come visit me at Damasuka. Another is that you can do an online retreat. You can do it through the internet. Uh, go to my website, damasuka.org, and it will give you all the information of what you need to do. We're starting to have more and more people, especially with what's happening with the disease and all of that sort of thing. We, we're having a lot more people sign up and you do a retreat for nine days or 10 days and we will guide you through the process and you will gain advantage. You will gain, you will teach yourself a lot of wonderful lessons that you can carry on with your daily life you learn to smile more, you learn to be at ease more. And you're teaching yourself more and more clearly how this process works, this process we call life. And you start letting go of the suffering. You don't cause yourself your own suffering. This is one thing that I, I kind of stress when I'm giving a, a retreat, that you can't blame anybody else for your suffering. You cause their suffering yourself. So take responsibility and learn how to let go of that suffering. And this is the way that I found it. Well, listen, Bonte, it's been really fun to have you on the podcast. And thanks so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Oh, you're very welcome. I hope to do it again anytime. I don't know if David told you, but I'd love to come in the spring um, for a, a much longer stay and, and even put on the robes if you'll have me. So I hope to see you again soon in person. Yes, I look forward to it. Okay, you're welcome one... anytime you can. Great. Yeah, I think my family wants to come too. So I'm hoping uh, <laughs> you'll see a few more of us. But um, good. Yeah, really good to see you again. And, and thanks for doing this. Okay. All right, I'll sign off now. Be well, uh, Bonte. Let, let me do what I do at the end of every Dhamma talk is I share merit. Okay, yeah, let's Please. do that. Let's do that. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. 
may all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu. Be well, be happy, have fun. Thanks, Bhante. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.